so let's begin. Let me welcome you. Welcome everybody to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you here today. We've got a great topic this week with a pair of really, really important guests. And I'm looking forward to our conversation. But we've been talking about artificial intelligence actually for years. Uh, on the forum. You can go back and take a look at our archives. Um, after all, we're about the future. Now, for the past year, ever since ChatGPT took off, we've been doing more and more sessions on it. And we've approached ChatGPT and other generative AI from multiple directions and from multiple points of view. Today, I'd like to focus on generative AI and writing. And the best way to do that is by looking at some cutting edge research by a couple of professors who recently did a very, very important survey of the faculty who primarily teach writing. Uh, we've got Professor Daniel Ernst and Professor Troy Hicks. And in fact, let me just bring them up on stage one by one so that we can start our conversation. So to begin with, Professor Ernst. Good afternoon, sir. Hey, Brian, thanks for having me. Oh, a pleasure. Where have we found you today? I'm back in uh, beautiful Denton, Texas. It's about 55 degrees. Oh, nice. Nice. Uh, it's, this is when it's, it's, it's very, very pleasant. Indeed, a little bit nippy to be out in Texas. Yes. Well, Professor, and we have a tradition on the forum <clears throat> when we ask people to introduce themselves. We do it for talking about what we're going to be working on for the next year. So I'm curious, over 2024, what are the big ideas, the big topics, the big projects that are going to be occupying you as you progress forward? Well, uh, as we'll talk about today, uh, my colleague uh, Troy and I are working on putting together our thoughts uh, in a formal uh, paper of some kind. You know, we had our, our article on the conversation come out, but we're going to be working on a more formal paper. Um, and as for me, uh, you know, I, I'm thinking about, I think, I'm thinking I'm going to be uh, putting together a book proposal uh, this spring mm. uh, about AI and education. And so that'll be my project for this year is, is trying to, trying to write my thoughts down on, uh, on AI and education, kind of a big picture sort of yeah. uh, uh, take. So, yeah. Well, excellent. Excellent. And, and are you also teaching? Yes. I'm, I'll be teaching two courses this spring. So I think I'll have some time to actually work on the, uh, on the proposal. Very, very good. Very good. Well, uh, good luck with all of that, especially the book. Let us know. Um, and when it comes out down the road, let's really put this in for you to come and return to the forum to talk about it. I'd love to come back. Yeah. Oh, that would be great. That would be great. Uh, well, first of all, welcome, Professor Ernst. And let me get your uh, colleague, your co-conspirator, um, and we bring up Professor Troy Hicks. Greetings, sir. Hello. And where have we found you? Uh, right there in the middle of the Michigan, as I've been sharing in the chat, the middle <laughs> of the of Michigan, yes. <laughs> well, that's right, that's right. And I, I have to say, Troy, this is one of the challenges, one of the burdens I bear on the forum is this legend that you have to have a beard in order to be on the forum. Um, and, and, you know, yours, you, you're, you're very, very dapper in, in yours. Um, but you, you, you heard how I, uh, how we introduced Professor Ernst. What are you working on for the next year? What are the big projects and ideas for you? Yeah, so I'm pleased to be working with Daniel as we continue to uh, write up our paper. We're going to present at the Four Seas Conference in Spokane later this spring. I uh, also hope to be working on a book. In fact, uh, I would sign the contract. Another colleague of mine, Dr. Kristen Turner from Drew University, we're focusing our AI book more on the secondary uh, grades, like fourth through 12th grade, uh, English language arts instruction, but I'll be working on that and planning a few different workshops and seminars and activities for K-12 colleagues uh, through Central Michigan University and other programs. So doing some hands-on, minds-on work with teachers as we all try to figure out these tools. Oh, fantastic. I would I would love to, uh, to bring you back to the forum to, to talk about that. Um, when you when you can, I mean, it, it takes time to write a book, and I know you both are busy, but I would love to uh, host you to describe it. In fact, if depending on the timing, we could bring you both back as a double header for both of your books. Thank you. Um, well, friends, if you're new to the Future Trends Forum, uh, I'm going to ask our guests a couple of questions, um, but I'd like you to start thinking about your questions, uh, what you'd like to ask 
uh, both of these uh, fine professors. Um, and uh, put if you'd like, start practicing your questions out in the chat. In fact, we've already got a bunch of different ideas that are starting to bubble up there. And don't forget the uh, Q&A box and, of course, also the ability to join us on stage. One more thing before I begin. On the bottom left of the screen, you should see a kind of tan-colored box. It says conversation article. And that's a very, very elegant overview of their research. So if you haven't seen it yet, just click on that and, and take a look at it. So I guess my, my first question for the two of you, um, Daniel and, and Troy, is a, a major concern in your survey that faculty showed was about cheating or academic integrity. And I'm curious if, if you could break that down a bit. What were faculty most concerned about uh, when it comes to uh, in using AI to uh, to create material in a way that might run a thwart of academic integrity? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> I think our survey showed that, you know, AI is multifaceted, right? You can use it for a lot of different parts of the writing process. Um, but I think the greatest concern among the, the population we sampled was using it essentially to replace all of the sort of thought uh, all together that goes into writing. So kind of just from beginning to end, having it generate an essay and then students turning it in without thinking about it too much, um, which I think is a legitimate concern. You know, the the headline of the article, you know, says that, that you know, there's more to the concern than cheating, um, which is true. But I think the primary concern is that, you know, without having to you know, write from uh, zero, you know, do the entire writing process, you're basically sort of sidestepping the sort of critical thinking uh, part of writing. Um, and so, again, I think that's a legitimate concern. Um, I don't know, Troy, if you want to add to that. Yep, I was trying to respond to a message in the chat there. Um, I'll grab a list of some resources I gathered for the National Council of Teachers of English Conference with some other colleagues here um, in 2023. I'll throw that link in. Yeah, I think it was less a concern about outright students are going to go copy and paste from someplace, obviously. Internet's been around a while. There are essay mills. There are people that you can pay to write your own original papers. Uh, that is not new. Uh, and unfortunately, that is still going to go on in this age of AI. I uh -huh. think, yes, that theme that we, we came up with and uh, trying to understand what our colleagues' concerns were, and it ranges from that, yes, there is the outright copying worry, to the what kinds of disciplinary ways of thinking, creative ways of thinking are they going to miss out on if they just jump right in and use the AI? Uh, rather yeah. than try to um, actually go through a process, which I think for those of us that have been in writing instruction for a long time really echoes many of the same themes and principles we know about best practices. We have to model and mentor our students through the writing process and, and show them these disciplinary ways of thinking and these different genres and how these genres work. So um, in some ways, and I joke with my own doctoral students about this, um, no finding is a finding, right? The concerns are echoing a lot of what we've heard for many, many years. And yet at the same time, AI, I think, cuts at the emotional heart of teaching. And perhaps we can talk a little bit more about that. Like it's, yeah. yes. it's taking away a bit of what teachers are expected to do in the ways they uh, prompt students to work and provide them with feedback. Mm -hmm. uh, those, that's, and did that emotional response show up in your survey? I would say so. There were some pretty visceral responses, some uh, some people that I think just wanted to get a few things off their chest and uh, the, mm -hmm. the uh, empty box uh, to type in an open-ended response on the survey gave them opportunity to do so. I can't remember exactly what was said, but there were some thoughts about AI writing tools being the end of academia and whatnot, as you can likely imagine. But then, yeah, I think the, the other part of it is just the, the hard work of teaching. Like we, we put a lot of ourselves, we teach who we are. And when we suddenly feel like students are circumventing the writing process and maybe circumventing the kind of instruction that we're trying to offer to them mm -hmm. and the support that we're trying to give them, um, that hits right here, right? It, it feels like we're not only being cheated in the academic honesty sense, but that uh, part of who we are and what we do is being undermined um, in the types of relationships we build with students. Hmm. 
Oh, I could see that. Uh, uh, two quick meta notes, by the way. Uh, first, if you're seeing a big furry tail whip back and forth in front of my face, it's one of the cats who has decided to show off. There, she always wants to appear on screen. Uh, this is this is Ash, our forum friend. Um, but also uh, in the chat, uh, Sarah San Gregorio, our good friend in New Jersey, asks if uh, it would be okay to for me to post a uh, lightly edited transcript of this chat to my blog. Um, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, please, in the chat, uh, let me know if you have any issues or requests with that. Um, well, these are good responses. Um, thank you both, uh, Daniel Troy. I think that matches a lot of what we're what we're seeing out there in the world. Um, your survey also took a look at, if you will, some of the more positive uses, some of the ways that instructors, writing instructors, were hoping to use generative AI as part of classroom teaching. And I'm wondering if you could say a bit about what the results showed. What are some of the pedagogies that the writing instructors revealed? Yeah, I think uh, the biggest one was uh, in the invention stage of writing. So just trying to you know, using using AI as a tool to come up with interesting things to write about. Um, you know, I think uh, I think part of I think if you talk to any writing instructor. Um, one of the hardest things to do is to get students not to just write the very first thing that comes to their mind, right? But to actually sort of, um, you know, think before they write. And I think these AI tools can help do that, right? I mean, and again, the the concern is a, there's a fine line between uh, between that and the concern, which is they're just going to completely use the AI to think for them. But I think where, what what teachers can do, where we can sort of help uh, and insert ourselves, is to help help them sort of negotiate with the AI and use the AI less as a replacement for their thinking and more as a partner uh, in tandem to help sort of synthesize something original and insightful. Um, and so, you know, I think personally, I wrote about this in a uh, an essay I wrote for the Dallas Morning News, but I think, you know, I, I'm a, I, my field is rhetoric and composition. So I, I read about the history of rhetoric a lot and I teach classes on it. And and one of the major uh, written genres from uh, ancient classical Greece was the dialogue, right? I mean, if you read the Socratic dialogues, the Platonic dialogues, um, the way they sort of uh, advance knowledge or the way they sort of synthesize and move their, their sort of uh, observations forward is through a manufactured dialogue between two people to keep the conversation going. I think we're going to see sort of a renaissance with that kind of genre in the form of dialogues between students and AIs and uh you know the way we assess it is like you know where can you take this dialogue where can you lead the ai to to help sort of um you know come up with something original or insightful or, or new right and again you have to strike that balance between uh you know pushing the ai forward and not and not letting it completely uh do the thinking for you and i think that's where uh, teachers can sort of help uh facilitate that mm -hmm. um I love that, Daniel. It makes me think too of of, of some of the early modern dialogues. Uh, you know, Galileo published a couple of essays uh, in dialogue form, which are just just wild. But this does lead to another part of your research, which is that okay, if we have students engaging with generative AI as a uh, you know co-writer, writer buddy, uh, revision assistant, brainstorming help, uh, there's a great UNESCO. Um, uh, list of, I think, 13 different roles that a, um, an AI can play with a student. If that's the case, then to what extent do we need to hire writing faculty? And so that was that last concern was actually something that uh, that you address in your research as well. Can, can you speak to that a bit? Yeah, you know, and I'll kick it here to Troy in a second because we were actually talking about this beforehand, but I think um, you know, as much as the AI role is still sort of fuzzy, but coming into focus, right? Um, I think the new human roles are still sort of fuzzy and coming into focus. Um, and so whether I think there is a legitimate concern that teachers are just going to be relegated to moderators or proctors, uh, you know, just kind of monitoring students interacting with AIs. And I, I don't want to see that. I, th I would think that I, I think that would be a bad sort of uh, future for education. But I think that there are uh, less uh, bad uh, alternatives out there. And I think there are ways that, you know, what we teach might shift a little bit. You know, we might be teaching more metacognition, more metacognitive skills, more critical reading skills, more editing skills, you know. So uh, 
it's a trade-off, right? As much as like the load of the workload of writing may be reduced or changed in terms of writing a first draft, now there's going to be more emphasis on editing, right? Uh, if you if you generate some a dra first draft with the help of the AI, uh, you still need to sort of go through and, and and edit it and make it say what what it needs to say. So um, I think we can sort of see trade-offs where you know maybe one part of the load, the workload, cognitive load is reduced in one area, but it, it sort of reemerges in another, and that's where we can uh, you know refocus some of our teaching, uh, which we already do. Uh, yeah. You know, it's like we don't already teach metacognition. Um, I just think it, that might be more sort of valued or rewarded in a world where we can sort of instantaneously generate uh, content. I think that's uh, that, that reminds me of, of what I've heard from other disciplines, uh, for example, in, in foreign language, the idea that AI may help with um, repetitious uh, testing and drilling and vocabulary, basic grammar, freeing up the instructor to do more uh, intellectually complicated and challenging tasks. Yeah, and that's, you know, that is, uh, that sounds really good in theory. I, I acknowledge that there's all kinds of ways in practice that that could not turn out as good as it sounds in theory. But mm -hmm. I do think that that's kind of uh, one sort of positive way, I guess, to sort of envision uh, a future with AI. What's the uh, what's the old joke in in theory? There's no difference between theory and practice, but in practice <laughs> there is. Right? Uh, yes. so let let me stop interrogating our our four excellent guests, uh, and let me give over the floor to you. And again, if you're new to the forum, remember there are a couple of ways that you can put questions forth. So on the bottom of the screen is that white strip, and there are a couple of buttons there, a few buttons, and one of them is a question mark, and that's your Q and A box. So you can type in your Q, your question, your comment, your request, and when the time is right, I'll flash it on the screen like I'm about to do right now. Because Troy, you're talking about metacognition, we have a question for our excellent friend Sarah San Gregorio, like this. I'm thinking about student metacognition and building it more overtly into assignment frameworks. Thoughts? Yeah, I can offer a little bit uh, about that. In fact, I'm going to pull up a link to a document. This, this document's received a um, little bit of critique in the composition world, so I won't go into all that. Um, but uh, it's called the Framework for Success in Post-Secondary Writing, and it talks about the um, habits of mind that uh, writers should possess and that we can more overtly teach. So here, I'll put this in the chat, um, the framework. And I think that when we when we use that, and also I put in the chat this link to the professional knowledge for the teaching of writing, what are the things that we expect students to be able to do? Well, you could go into that framework, and I, I'm going to pull it open in a tab here and just pull up an example. So one of them is about um, curiosity, the desire to know more about the world. You go in, you look at the specific objectives, you know, use inquiry as a process, seek relative authoritative information, conduct research, communicate findings. Um, and it's been shared in the chat here, how can we use these tools to engage students in those processes? So rather than just going into ChatGPT or Bing and saying, you know, give me an outline on climate change, you know, and how yeah. that would turn into my essay, uh -huh. what are the what are the key considerations around climate change? How would someone from a politically conservative perspective uh, look at climate change? Someone from a politically liberal perspective look at climate change. One exercise that I've tried with people, um, and I think we use the Bing version because um, we do have access to that now at CMU. Oh. We took a, a politically loaded. Um, ideologically charged perspective on climate change, put it in there and then ask, please identify keywords and phrases in this and, and what political perspectives they might um, have. So again, opening up curiosity, using the AI as a tool to foster those habits of mind. So going back and look, what is it? what are the metacognitive meta attributes we would want writers to have how can we have them use AI tools in those ways? Oh. Similarly, if they're going to be planning and they're expected to plan and organize, use the AI tool. I need to organize a draft on this, this, and this. Help me prioritize mm -hmm. the importance of these three topics or these three perspectives or something like that. So um, I think that could be interesting. And then they compare and contrast. What did you get when you type that in, Daniel? And I can tell you what I got when I typed it in. And let's look at what the different outputs shared. Yeah, I think the so comparison is the most important thing because oh. yeah. one thing that I've done with my students already is, so once one assignment I had them, they had to choose a topic that they knew something about, write 500 words on it. 
then I, they had to prompt the a, a large language model to write 500 words on that same topic and then they had to write 500 words comparing the two and i uh, a really interesting uh uh one one of my students uh he worked as he works as a property assessor and so he wrote 500 words on how how you go about like the procedure in assessing property and then he had ai you know write it and then he compared the two and it was really interesting you know he he identified differences uh, in the rhetoric in in the writing, um, but he also it, it also made him think about like you know from a technical writing perspective. I don't know if people out there are are, are technical in the technical writing world. It made him sort of confront like how he sort of sequenced uh, you know what goes into assessing a property, and then how uh, the AI sequenced it as well, and some of the differences there, and how audiences might uh, sort of interpret them differently. So um, I have already started doing stuff like that where, you know, I had, I taught another class. It was a professional writing class, but it was for visual arts majors. And so in that one, I had them use AI image generators. And I said, all right, you know, take one of the, one of the pieces of art that you have made and then prompt uh, an AI image generator to uh, make this, the same thing or as close to what your original piece is as you can, and then write a, a thousand word essay comparing and contrasting the two. Uh, and again, it was very, uh, very interesting. And, uh, you know, some it, it forced the students to sort of uh, analyze the thing, uh, I think more closely because it was their own art versus an AI image generator that was attempting to sort of do exactly what they did. And so I, I think that, that it made, it almost made them rise to the challenge a little bit more because it was like them versus the machine. So yeah. I think there, yeah. I think there's a lot yeah. of different creative ways to sort of embed the AI response to our writing prompts in our in our uh, in our assignments themselves as a way to sort of preemptively maybe uh, ward off uh, plagiarism, um, but also to sort of raise the stakes a little bit because I think I think you can kind of create this kind of uh, competition between the student and the machine that that ends up sort of uh, motivating them to maybe you know, not all students, obviously, but maybe motivate some of them to, to, to try a little harder, perhaps. Oh, that's fascinating. I think that kind of competitive drive. Oh, yeah. this is good. Well, Daniel, Troy, thank you both for the really terrific answer. Uh, as usual, Sarah asks great questions. Uh, and again, friends, if you're new to the forum, that's an example of one of those Q&A box questions. And we have a whole bunch of them lined up. So let me just uh, grab a couple more of these. This is one that uh, comes back to, I think, the end of your research here. Uh, this is from Leanne MacArthur. We know the anxiety producing things. I'm curious what you are most excited about in this era of AI. What do you think the educators you surveyed are most excited about? Want to jump in first on that, Daniel? Yeah, go for it. Okay. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that came out, and this, this came out after the survey and in the focus group conversations and many of the workshops and webinars I've been fortunate to be part of this fall, um, is that there are a whole lot more tools than just ChatGPT. I think everyone hears AI, they liken it to ChatGPT. One of the tools that I found really interesting is perplexity. And you start by asking it a question, it generates a response, it adds in hyperlinks to footnotes uh, where it's get, getting its information, which I know Bing is doing a little bit more robustly now, not just trying to sell you uh, hotel nights and flights to places, but um, you know, actually giving you real information to different things. Um, and then you can have this conversation about source evaluation and lateral reading and what does this source say about this topic and what does that source say about that topic? And so seeing the variety of AI tools that are out there and then also that, that large um, category of tools, I guess for lack of better term, to be copy editing tools like Copy mm -hmm. AI, Writer, Jasper, all of those tools. The fact that we can really explore audience and genre and tone and think about what it means if I ask the AI to generate something as a blog post as compared to a YouTube script, as compared to a social media headline, and then comparing and contrasting, what does that look like? So we had um, one of the professors uh, in the focus group was a marketing professor and was talking about how they were trying to integrate those AI tools into their instruction and having students see um, what they could do in comparing and contrasting across the tools. So um, I think there are opportunities out there, especially if we expand our horizon beyond just ChatGPT. Really, really good point. 
really good point. ChatGPT seems to loom largest uh, from all the data I've seen, but we are we have a boom time of so so many different tools. Uh, thank you for the great question uh, and and for the for the really good answer. In fact, um, speaking of which, uh, here's a related note: when a, a campus licenses one. Uh, this is a comment from Lisa Rourke. This semester, all first-year writing classes at Brandeis U will pilot Lex, an AI writing assistant, during the research essay unit. I feel like it could go well or horribly wrong. And welcome advice. I, well, I, I agree. I think it could go either way. Um, you know, I think that, like, I think that that's smart, I guess. Uh, you know, I think I think the future I think the future of research is definitely going to include these tools. I mean, you know, if you think about if you kind of take a step back, um, AI is really just kind of bringing the internet to you instead of you having to go out into the internet, right? So, uh, in terms of research, uh, it's not different in 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 kind. It's different in degree. And yes, you're still going to have to use the same sort of uh, critical evaluation tools that you use when you assess, you know, information you get from a journal or from a website, all that's going to apply. It's just going to be, um, I think it's going to matter more in the language itself. And, you know, the last question was about what are you excited about with this? And, you know, if, if anyone out there is like me, which I assume a lot of you are, if you're in education or especially in writing education, you know, I'm really interested in language and in words. And I think now more than ever, because of, of large language models, the value of language is, is becoming more and more apparent, right? I mean, you know, when has like the grammar or the word choice of a prompt that you enter? <laughs> yes. I like to I like to point out that you know, on Google for a long time, what we taught our students was don't don't type a direct question into the search bar, right? That'll confuse the search engine. Just type in your keywords. Now we're going the other direction. Now it's like if you change one or two words in your prompt, it can result in a totally different uh, generated generated content. So I think if you're someone who's interested in language and the nuances and the, the complexity of, of language, now is probably the most exciting time in a long time because I think things like grammar and rhetoric and critical reading uh, and thinking, these things are only going to become more and more important as this research is is refined. So I think if, if with the right mindset, this could be actually an important time for people like us, uh, people who are interested in, in language. I agree. That's a wonderful, wonderful way of putting it. Um, I mean, where word choice matters so much, like uh, Mark Twain's famous line, what was it? The uh, proper word is the difference between lightning and lightning bug. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we have a, a series of questions now that are, are kind of uh, maybe technical or very, very focused. Um, and I, I want to get these in. And by the way, again, friends, if, if you're new to the forum, I can see you know, a lot of you are figuring out the Q&A box. Just look for that question mark. But if you want to join us on stage, again, just press the raise hand button. And uh, you can see that our, our guests are nice and we'd be glad that we'd be just delighted to have you. Um, and this is, this is a question that I've heard a few people asking uh, in different ways. This is from Thomas. He asks, how do you use AI tools to develop one's inner voice of a writer if, if it's dependent for creative ideations or develop editorial sense? I really appreciate that question. I think it hints at something that's going on in the chat right now, too, about when, how, and why we ask students to use these tools or like the yeah. last yeah. could go horribly wrong. One of the things, the, the tool I'm thinking of right now is WordTune, but I'm sure others do similar types of things mm -hmm. where you can highlight a word or a phrase or a sentence and then ask it for suggestions to expand or contract or be more formal or be more creative. And it will come up with six, eight, 10 examples. And to me, that's that moment of the voice is, okay, what sounds like me? What doesn't sound like me? What seems plausible that this would have come out my mouth or my fingertips or uh, putting pen to paper? What does not sound plausible at all? And uh, where are the places where the AI generated text actually gives me momentum and helps move me forward? Where does it stifle me? Um, are there moments where I could copy and paste and acknowledge that I've used the AI um, and it, it made good sense and it saved me time? Or are there times where it's just a hindrance and it, it's not helping me at all? So I think that helping students work through the AI tools and ask those questions and foreground their own voice in that process is really important. 
Um, there's another, yeah, word two. So there is another, um, uh, you know, conversation going on about like the use of Grammarly. And we've had this conversation forever. Like when, how, and why do we accept the grammar suggestion? And when do we ignore it? Because actually we did want a one word sentence for that paragraph or, you know, for that particular sentence. We wanted to articulate something and one word was enough. And that's not a grammatical inconsistency. I meant to do that as a writer. So I think that those are the types of conversations, again, going back to the, um, the idea of, you know, student agency and voice, uh, helping them understand when, how, and why to use the AI. No, thank you. Thank you. Uh, quick shout, Shelby, I know you have to run, but thank you very much for, uh, for that assistance. And Troy, thank you for that, for that solid answer. Let's, let's press on this a little further, because we have a few more questions that are, are that kind of, again, I, I, I don't know if technical is the right word, but you'll, you'll see what I mean in a minute. This is one from Maureen Madden. Uh, who has a question about accessibility um, she, regarding students who require accommodations to participate such as captions alt text etc has anyone published something regarding the positive use of ai especially for diverse learners not um, i'm not sure about i'm not sure about publishing right now but a lot of the major tech companies are you know the 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 big thing right now is is which is what's called uh, large multimodal models, right? So I mean the the large language model is kind of the what they call a foundational model. It's kind of the basis for um, these other types of uh, generative AI, like image generators, video generators, music generators, um, and and so all that's being built on top. But now these multimodal models are interesting because they can do things like text to speech or they can go from speech to speech. So you can translate people's language to another language. You can translate text to spoken text, um, which I think is is going to uh, kind of revolutionize accessibility. I mean, we have things like screen readers uh, and so forth right now, but this uh, these large multimodal models are going to be much more uh, dexterous and much more uh, you know, granular in their ability to uh, uh, to help with uh, accessibility. And in terms of, you know, again, you know, using that, capturing that technology for uh, uh, accessibility and, and, and pedagogy, I think that's going to become uh, easier, which I think is good for teachers, because a lot of times teachers, um, there's a lot of unpaid labor, I think, that goes into uh, teachers working to make uh, their materials more accessible um, uh, which is, is important, but, uh, you know, I think that a lot of times that's just kind of expected on top. And I think hopefully, uh, the AI will sort of streamline a lot of that and make, uh, make accessibility much more easier for everybody. And then everybody benefits. Well, thank you. That's, that's, that's a really, really solid answer. Um, we have, um, uh, a couple of uh, one one more question to ask to follow up on this line again this is uh, i'm thinking this is technical this is from uh, jill quant jill I, I hope i didn't garble your last name please let me know uh citing ai using the guidelines provided by mla is impractical if students are using AI as a tool and not simply copying and pasting large chunks how do you recommend we teach students to cite ai mm, so if I'm understanding that question right, what Jill is saying is that students are using the AI, but not necessarily like they're using it as a thinking partner, but they're not necessarily copying and pasting huge chunks into the paper. Because again, there's this whole continuum of how people are using AI. I think in that case, uh, I've seen a lot of instructors adopting language for syllabi and assignments that say, you may use AI as a thinking partner, as a tool, you know, a research tool or something like that. And to say, just please acknowledge what you've done. And one of the things that Perplexity did early, and I know ChatGPT does now, and I think other tools are starting to do more, is that you can create, as I did and put in the chat a few minutes ago, an external hyperlink. So the instructors could say, hey, I, I, I encourage you to use AI as a thinking partner to get started, to ask some questions, to maybe frame an outline for your paper. Mm -hmm. Please provide me with the direct link to your chat GPT output. Boom. So there you could go. You don't have to get all formal on the MLA versus APA versus, you know, what gets cited where and when and how. There are other tools, though, and the one I know that's doing it directly, and I'm sure others are as well, but one I know for sure is Quillbot. 
and you can, as you're having Quillbot generate AI text, it will actually come up with a little pop-up that says, do you want to add a citation for this? And even going through an exercise where you're modeling your writing process and you're um, then asking Quillbot to do some AI generation for you, and they're going, oh, hey, look, it's asking me if I want to cite this. What do you all think? Should I cite this? Did it give me enough information? Like going through that think aloud as a model with your students during a lesson, I think could be really helpful. And um, to then to then show, yes, here, there are actual formal ways to cite this. And then how and when and why do you cite that? That opens up another round of conversations mm -hmm. depending mm -hmm. on your genre and purpose. And those conversations are ones that writing instructors are perfectly positioned to hold. Yeah. Well, speaking of, con thank you. Thank you for that answer. And again, that's that's a great question. All these questions today are superb. Um, now, let me uh, let me change the format a little bit and let me introduce a video question. This is from our good friend, Peter Shea. And let me bring him up on stage. Hello, Peter. Hi, can you guys hear me? Perfectly. Great, great. Uh, you know, I love the answer about the application of AI um, to diverse learners. I think that's one of the great under-recognized values here. Um, and I just wanted to follow up with a question. Do you see, at my college, we've used AI to generate metaphors that, that, that you make use of our immigrant students' cultural knowledge. Um, do you see AI as a tool that, that, can, that can, is uniquely useful for helping bridge the gap between cultural knowledge for second language students mm. learning how to write um, in terms of um, helping them more quickly acclimate to the cultural knowledge they need to, to, to master our kind of academic discourse. Yeah, I wonder, can I ask you a quick follow up on that? Like, are you, are you considering like the students could ask the AI like, oh, I heard this, uh, idiom or this phrase that someone you like using the AI in that way or like taking something from their own language and then trying to look for an approximation in English both. or I would say both, both. I, yeah. it's like a missing link that's been a big issue because we've had so much energy put in, into second language um, learning by um, passionately committed educators but it's an exhausting task it's really Herculean this seems to be one area where and a a well-designed AI assistant can really bridge the gap. Yeah, I, I think it's useful. I mean, I, I am not an uh, expert by any stretch in teaching English as a, a second language um, or embracing. I am not multilingual myself. I am a hopefully American monolingual person. So um, I don't have all the, the experience myself to know that. What I would say is from conversations I've had with teachers who are teaching multilingual learners or and who are multilingual themselves, it seems to me that that would be a perfectly reasonable task and asking AI to do the, that type of work. And then again, just like you would ask a student, don't just trust Google Translate, like you've got to go look at it more carefully, maybe share with the native speaker, confirm that this is accurate. Um, it, it again could open up some great conversations. One other thing you made me think of, I, I have a colleague who does teach multilingual learners and she has like a, she, I can't remember what she describes it as, like an open door policy. Like as you are new to America, you're going to hear things, see things, wonder things. No question is taboo. It, whether you think it's taboo, that's okay. You're not going to offend me. I will try to answer it as best I can. And I could see using the AI as a way to, oh, I heard this phrase or I'm wondering about this. And maybe that could be a way um, to get the answers. Although I know ChatGPT will limit you on the types of questions you can ask it. Um, so that, that could be another possibility too. Just one interesting, uh, just another aspect of this is for faculty members who like, are born outside the United States, one of my colleagues is using AI to put it to to um, imitate his voice, and then take his written lectures and put them, in, you know, in a, in a clearer American standard accent than his own in the classroom, mm. as a way of, of overcoming again a cultural barrier from the instructor side. So I think there, I, I think there are lots of wonderful applications for these kind of tools. Yeah. 
in terms of the, the language issues that we've traditionally addressed. Yeah, I think I think these things are uniquely helpful, especially in writing in a, in a foreign language. Um, mm -hmm. I still think if, you know, in terms of bridging the cultural gap, I still think in-person human, you know, conversation is the best way to like, you know, AI could help you learn to write better, I think, in another language. You know, who knows down the road if it could help you speak better. Um, but I, I still think if you want to, you know, bridge a cultural gap, you need to immerse yourself in that culture uh, would be my response. All these, Thank you. Um, Oh, thank you for the great question, Peter. And uh, again, friend, that's an example of a video question and Peter is proof. You don't have to have a beard to be up here on the, on the forum. Um, but also I, I do wonder, Daniel, uh, Troy, have you played with using um, ChatGPT or Bard or Bing or Claude, et cetera, to create a simulation environment with multiple characters to create a kind of simulated immersion? I personally have not. I, I think that's a really interesting question. I mean, I've had some students as we've played around with it a little bit, like simulate a dialogue, like imagine you're in a dialogue with somebody, ask this, ask that, or imagine a dialogue between two characters where one character wants this and one character wants that, but I, not extensively, you know. Yeah, me neither. It's fun. It's fun. If you want, I can send you some some links to some of my accounts for that. It's 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 pretty great. Ethan Mollick, uh, a, a Wharton professor, has been uh, doing some fun stuff with that, uh, and a couple of others. Um, but friends, I'm conscious of time, and I want to make sure everyone gets a chance to ask their question. Uh, Daniel, Troy, I mentioned before that a series of those questions were kind of uh, tactical or technical, very, very focused. Here are a couple that are a little broader. I, I think you'll see what I mean. This is one from our, our great friend, Carl Hakarainen, uh, coming to us from New England. And he asks, how can writing instruction help students who will use AI in writing for various future careers? Uh, he gives the examples, public safety, healthcare, marketing, business processes, but I could think of others. Yeah, I think um, uh, I think this is, I, the way I like to put it is I think like AI will sort of raise the floor of writing. Mm. Um, mm. I think the, you know, the top writers, uh, professional writers are always going to be more or less writing their own pros, you know, they might be using AI in some capacity, but I think ultimately they're going to still be writers. But I do think for uh, professions where writing is an aspect of what you do, but not the primary thing, I do think that that is going to sort of raise the, the, the floor, the quality of writing, because if anyone, if anyone in this crowd has played around with uh, these tools, you'll note that like they are actually kind of best at the kind of boilerplate uh, workplace uh, genres that 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 a lot of people in a lot of different industries, you know, right, like memos and, and, and emails, and I've used it to generate rubrics and, uh, assi you know, help with assignment sheets and uh, various administrative uh, genres that I've had to write in now. Um, so I think that uh, I think it's going to raise the floor. And, and I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I think there's a lot of writing that we wish we could sort of just outsource to someone else um, that I don't think we're really, I don't think that's going to negatively cognitively impact us if we off, off, uh, you know, outsource some of that type of writing, uh, yeah. you know, I could be wrong, but, um, but I, yeah, I do think that it'll, uh, it'll streamline some, uh, some jobs and, 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 and careers that again, use, use writing to some extent, but where writing is not uh, sort of super important, I would say. Um, I in October, I led a workshop at the Educause conference on technology and education, and I, I asked people what they were already doing with AI. And that was the most popular use, was writing that people weren't excited about. Um, you know, memos, uh, documentation for things people weren't interested in, um, sometimes things that, that they were interested in but were hard, uh, job application letters or RFPs. Um, so that's, that's, that's already going on, I think. Um, Hey, here's, oh, oh, go ahead. Sorry. If I may, really quickly, like one of the conversations that people will say, like, well, here's why I don't want to use AI, uh -huh. because I want students to understand all these things. And then I think, you know, there are books, and this is one that's popular at our university, perhaps others, like the They Say, I Say sentence templates and uh -huh. models where, you know, we use these models or formulas to begin writing, not quite like a five paragraph essay, but we use you know, a pretty straightforward sentence template, like, 
uh, you know, in order to test the hypothesis, such and such, we assess such and such, our calculations suggest such and such, or um, my explanation accounts for such and such, but does not explain such and such. You know, so there are these templates. And I think that's one of the things that the AI can do for us is it can help get the template stuff out so we can then actually spend our time doing the creative work that we want, knowing that we've already met the expectation for these different genres. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you both for really good answers. Uh, Carl, that's a, that's a really, really important question. I think this is one of the big drivers that I've been seeing among academics is not the sense of the technology is interesting or exciting or scary, but that it's already in the world. And as we prepare our students to enter that world as workers, et cetera, then uh, we need to prepare them uh, for that. Here's a, a related question. Uh, again, this is a kind of broader perspective. Uh, this is from Walter, uh, and he asks um, a question about demographics. Uh, do you see an age-based component to this discussion about writing independence and general a generative AI? If students depend on these tools for elementary school, what happens when they get to college? I, I think those are two different questions. Uh, they're, they're related, but they're both very good. Here, I'll, I'll put that back up. So yeah, you can... do you want to take it from the survey? I can talk a little bit about the K-12 well, piece with some of my colleagues. Yeah. Well, yeah, so our survey our survey was of instructors, and we, we actually were interested in this question about, is there a difference in, in anxiety among uh, people of different ages? Um, so I don't know if that's that might be a slightly different question. But interestingly, there was no difference. There was no, you know, I, I hypothesized, you know, greater anxiety among older uh, respondents than younger, but that wasn't the case at all. Um, as for, I do think there is a difference in uh, the role that AI will play in lower grades of education versus higher grades, um, but I already think there's a difference in the way we teach writing to elementary schools versus college students. Um, I think that, so I, I think that difference is already there. I think it, it, it'll persist with AI. It'll just um, be, be somewhat different. You know, I think I think in, in college, higher education, college level writing instruction, for instance, there's going to be a lot more emphasis on, um, on you know, writing back to the uh, challenging the AI uh, and that sort of thing. Whereas I think in lower grades, uh, the AI will be kind of used to sort of help just learn new things you can do with with, with language. So um, that's kind of oversimplified, but that, that's that's sort of what I see. I don't know what, what Troy sees. Yeah, I, I think as with many things with teaching writing, you know, we, we don't expect that a kindergartner is going to be able to write a fully formed literary analysis like a 12th grade AP student would. Um, and at the same time, we're asking them both to add details and examples to their writing, you know, so what are the kinds of details and examples? What are the types of um, content expectations and things that we would ask at different times and stages? Okay. And so again, when, why, and how do we want students to use those AI tools? I, you know, I talk to teachers all the time. They're like, there are moments where we have lids down moments in our classrooms. Put the lids down, folks. Pull out a notebook. I want you to jot some ideas here. Then we're going to go back to the computer and start to type them up and do some internet searching and things like that. So I think it's a matter of um, coming up with your own balance in your teaching. Like, when am I going to ask students to use these? When am I not? When am I going to tell them explicitly they should? When am I going to tell them explicitly they should not? Um, those are those are conversations that you can have um, with your colleagues and with your students. And there's so many great comments. I'm trying to keep up with the chat, Brian, but there's so many great comments and questions that are rolling in here at the end. Um, and I hope this kind of ad addressed some of these things about the adaptations. I think drafts, multiple drafts, uh, multiple rounds of feedback, tracking changes, um, asking students to record screen recordings uh, where mm -hmm. they can go back and say, hey, mm -hmm. here's where I put my own ideas in. Here's some AI generated ideas. Here's where I got feedback from someone. Now, granted, you can't watch 155 minute screencasts every weekend for every essay that that would be over and above what we're already asking writing instructors to do but i think at least once a semester having students do some kind of metacognition where they're documenting their work through a screencast and then maybe commenting back on top of their screencast with you know some um, video annotation tools that could be really helpful uh, oh, thank you uh, and i appreciate the uh your your 
noting of academic labor on this. Um, very good question. Uh, we have two questions from uh, Ayla, Ayla Moore. Uh, there's a quick question and then a, a deeper question. The quick question is, she wants to know if you could share your survey instrument. Um, and I don't know if you've already done that in the in the chat, um, but is, is there a way to find that um, online easily or uh, is that something which you haven't shared yet? We haven't published it yet. I can send, if Ayla wants to drop your email, I can send you a spreadsheet of all of our findings. Uh, but that's going to be published, you know, the more on the results than when we included in the conversation piece, that'll be published in the future. Oh, good. Good. I, I appreciate that, Daniel. And, and both of you, I appreciate then the you giving the forum uh, an early look at uh, your your results as they emerge and as your research develops. Ila, thank you for that. Uh, her, her bigger question is one that as a futurist, I, I absolutely love. Um, and uh, this is one from the chat, so I'll just read this out loud. What do the speakers think about the claim that, quote, hybrid human and AI writing will become the new normal, unquote? So hybrid human and AI writing will become the new normal. I think it already has. And uh, I see wow. Isla put the note in there. Isla, I believe, is the correct pronunciation. So Isla, I think we've already seen that, obviously. Autocomplete, spell check, grammar, voice to text. We're there. We're human hybriding our writing um, as, as it goes. I, I think the the question might be how often and to what extent we're going to see the hybridity happen. And again, I think that's the moment. I, I don't know that I'm quite ready to go back to the chisel and tablets, as was just alluded to in the chat. But I think there are moments where we ask students, yeah, you know, just close the computer for a moment and let's have a conversation. Let's pull out a pen and paper, some note cards some sticky notes. But then there are other moments where it's like, hey, we, we you've you already know how to compose an email uh, with the basics go ahead and use the AI type in your keywords get the text of it the main part of it generated go ahead it's perfunctory let's just move forward you don't even need to cite this and different people in different professions and at different times of the day and of the work day and of the work year are going to do that in different ways um, but yes I, I think there's going to be more and more hybridity as we continue to go on and um there are just so many so many things that it just opens up those conversations about why we're doing what we're doing as writers at any given moment that i think uh fascinates so many of us on the conversation today and why we love teaching writing ah that's beautiful yeah and i would just i would just say real quickly i think the main the operative word there is hybrid and what is being what's hybrid about it it's it's that ai generates via probability distributions it, it's quite literally math and humans don't, human brains don't work like that. And so I think what we're seeing is like uh, probability versus sort of possibility are gonna be, that's what's being hybridized, right? The, the AI is always gonna generate the most probable text, but we have a greater capacity, I would say, to imagine like more, you know, things that are less probable, but still possible. And so I think that's what's really gonna be hybrid is this interjection of sort of probabilistic reasoning into our more hmm. possibilistic uh, reasoning faculties, I guess. Probabilistic to possibilistic. Yes. That's a that's a terrific arc. Uh, Daniel, Troy, and everybody, with great regret, I, I have to wrap things up. Uh, we, we've just blasted through an hour uh, at, at top speed, and I want to make sure everyone gets a chance to resume their lives. Um, you two have been fantastic guests. Uh, I'm, I'm just astonished at how much you, you've revealed to us. Uh, and I'm just so glad at everything that has come up in, in our discussion. Let me ask a, a very practical question. How can we keep up with the two of you? What's, what's the best way to find out you know, your next work, your, your follow-up articles and, and your book projects and so on? Um, I, I have a website, just danielcernst.com. Uh, I'm, try, I'm trying to be updated more, but that's probably the best place to, to keep track of me. Um, and I'm at Texas Women's University in Denton, Texas. So anyone in the DFD, DFW area, you know, you can shoot me an email or find me at, uh, at TWU. So nice, nice. Thank you, thank you. And how about you, Troy? I am Hicks Tro pretty much everywhere. So I just dropped a <laughs> link to my blog in the, the chat. I'm not so good at keeping up with it. Uh, so uh, Brian, you're my role model when it comes to blogging. I've got to get better. Um, but uh, <laughs> 
all the other socials, if you pretty much look up Hicks Tro, that's you'll find me. Well, thank you, and uh, and thank you both for being so sociable. Um, I, I hope you uh, you both stay uh, warm and comfortable, um, especially as uh, as respective winters hit. And I'm I'm really looking forward to where you take this research uh, into your classes, into the books, into more articles. Thank you for spending such a kind hour with us. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Oh, pleasure. But don't go away, friends. Let me point out to where we're going next. Uh, if you'd like to keep talking about these issues, chisel or not, um, speaking of the socials, you can find me and the forum all over all these socials. Just use the hashtag FTTE. You can see me there on Twitter, Mastodon, Threads, Blue Sky, and, of course, my blog. Uh, if you'd like to look into our previous sessions on writing and or automation AI, just go to our forum archive, tinyurl.com slash ftfarchive. If you'd like to look into our upcoming sessions, some of which are about AI, but other topics as well, just go to forum.futureofeducation.us and you can find those. And let me once again thank you all for a terrific conversation. I'm looking forward to uh, putting up a transcript of this, probably in a few different posts. Um, I'm really grateful to you for sharing all of your time, uh, your thoughts with us. And um, I really hope that everybody stays well. This is, by the way, the first form of the year 2024. Uh, which used to be a very futuristic looking um, year and now is simply the year we live in. Um, this is the way the future works, but I'm really glad to spend the future working and thinking with all of you. Take care. Happy 2024, everyone. See you next time online. Bye-bye.